So um, I'm delighted to uh, be here with you today. I'm so delighted that I actually flew all night just to be here with you, and I'll then make my excuses. Jet lag will, anything I say that sounds silly is all, the, all uh, from jet lag and not from uh, my normal silliness. So I'm also here uh, to uh, welcome our, uh, my colleagues and panelists here. Oh, thank you. Inigo Saenz de Miera Cardenas, the Director General from Fondacion Botin, and Ivan uh, Vejvoda, Vejvoda, Vice President of Programs for the German Marshall Fund of the United States. And we're going to talk a little bit about kind of um, cross-border fertilization of ideas about how uh, foundations uh, and funders can respond to economic crises. And I want to um, talk to you a little bit about some of our experience working in the U.S., uh, particularly in one of my favorite places, uh, Detroit, Michigan, which uh, has right now a lot of similarities with places like Athens. So um, just to give you kind of the quick opening observations, and I'm going to tell you what my conclusions will be, too. Um, and you all know this already, and I just picked up today in the conversations, everybody knows how economic crisis really just exacerbates the scale and scope of the problems facing the poor. And for philanthropy in the U.S., uh, the poor are our uh, client. Uh, we care mostly about the poor and other excluded populations, and um, uh, the problems there are just uh, doubled or tripled with the advent of economic crisis. It also, of course, diminishes the resources and shortens the planning horizons for all institutions, both public and private. Um, one of the big problems we've run into is just how much um, the economic crisis has shortened the ability of governments to plan and to think in the long term and to really go into bunker mentality. And in extreme circumstances, and certainly the extreme circumstance of a place like Detroit, uh, economic crisis forecloses the ability of local government to support normal public functions, which is a big problem for th philanthropy because very often government comes and then asks you uh, to fund it. And one of the things we learned in the last session, when they added up all the resources that philanthropy had, they could probably uh, fund the public sector till about, what, January 6th of uh, any given year. So, and for us, we end up with very shrill and strident requests for funding and, you know, a, a much heavier contestation over a shrinking pie. These resources are shrinking and everybody who's doing important work in communities thinks that they uh, need it and that they deserve it. And um, it's one of those things that you just have to kind of, as a funder, be ready to gird your loins for because there's going to be lots and lots of requests for your money. Also, there's a tendency to try to pull you away from uh, the work that you're actually uh, set up to do, your mission, because of the exigencies of the time. And I think it's probably a mistake to drift too far from mission just because of extreme circumstances in the present. And then um, very often uh, you'll find that you get open hostility from even your best allies, which is always troubling. Um, and some of those allies can be public sector allies as well as other private sector allies. So the conclusions I'm going to draw, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about this with examples from Detroit, is that it's really, really important for philanthropy to know who you are. And uh, by knowing who you are, playing to your strengths. And what I mean by this really is philanthropy has a real penchant for um, delusions of grandeur. And if there's one thing that we should all do is kind of take real note of our limitations as well as the kind of power that we wield in communities because very often um, it's very embarrassing to bite off more than you can chew. And philanthropy can do that from time to time. Absolutely critical to be transparent and extremely clear about what you can and will do so that uh, ambiguity is a very, very uh, big problem when dealing with people who are very strident. So it's important to be transparent and clear. And it's also very important, and, and foundations are one of the few institutions that can act, actually take a long view. And sometimes a long view is really important because, um, as I mentioned in my second to last point, short-term remedies are very often deleterious to um, the achievement of long-term goals. I'll give you a very quick example. Um, a few years ago, the city of Chicago was trying to balance its budget, um, and they decided to balance their budget by selling off uh, public assets. In this case, they sold off their airport, and they sold off their parking meters. Um, now, what happened when they sold off their parking meters was that they made 
billions of dollars in one kind of fell swoop, um, and they balance their budget for one year, but the cost of parking in downtown Chicago at a parking meter went up from $1 an hour to $6.25 an hour and angered all the voters. So um, it's not clear that in the long term that's beneficial to anybody except for the company who bought the, uh, the parking meters. Um, and in many ways, you just kind of forestalled the inevitable because it was the very next year that Chicago was having trouble balancing its budget again. Anyway, the, the, the really the bottom line, for, I think, for philanthropy is that a clear strategy is the best inoculation to prevent distraction from your own mission and your broader uh, effectiveness. And so I think that uh, that's one of the things that um, I'm going to stress over and over and over again. Strategy, 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 and um, really a strategy that not only that you um, can adhere to, but that others can believe in as well. So let's talk about Detroit. So this is the uh, image that most people have of Detroit, um, a, a former grand city with a crumbling infrastructure, um, fabulous buildings all across the landscape of Detroit, now vacant and abandoned, um, whole blocks completely empty, and um, an entire kind of industrial uh, or post-industrial wasteland. And the truth of Detroit is that Detroit is, uh, has been in dire straits for a long time. Detroit lost two-thirds of its population from 1950 to 2010. And no, I don't think any community that loses two-thirds of its population can come through that unscathed. Um, and this is the enduring image of Detroit. And, uh, it, uh, and many people think that uh, Detroit, for one reason or another, is an absolute loss. All right, so for me, when we came to Detroit, we said, all right, what are we going to do when we get to Detroit? Because we're going to be overwhelmed with the kinds of requests we get from Detroit. Detroit has 25% unemployment rate, very much like the unemployment rate here in Greece. And the unemployment rate for the young in Detroit, especially young African Americans, is over 50%. Um, and so we said, the first thing we need to do is define ourselves who we are, what we're going to do, and what our goals are. Because if we didn't do that, we would be defined by other people. And so I don't need you to read you all this, but I just say that we came to Detroit and we, we presented basically our approach. We want to make the policies, the local policies, work for the poor. We want to make markets, private markets, work for the poor. And we want to involve the local populations uh, in solving their own problems. And uh, that's been kind of uh, the, the guiding light to everything we've done since we uh, came there. And we told people the role that we expected to play, that we're going, we, we're perfectly willing to invest in certain capacities to make the city work again, that we were committed to do the best kinds of analysis so that we'd make informed decisions and not decisions based on political exigencies or anything else, that we really believe that we're going to have to cross silos, and these silos might be um, functional silos where you're talking about the, the housing department and the, and the streets department and other departments working together, or it might actually be involving multiple jurisdictions in solving the problems of one city because one of the things we believe was that Detroit was not going to survive if it didn't get active participation of its surrounding neighbors, the wealthier suburbs that really had a stake in the future of Detroit as well. We believe that strong civic engagement was really important and that planning was going to be at the root of everything because the problem with Detroit was a planning problem. You don't lose two-thirds of your population over 60 years without lots and lots of failures on the planning side. And this is not just uh, public sector planning, it's private sector planning as well. Then we stated our principles that our intervention should address the structural elements of the problems facing the poor, not just address the issues that they confront today, like getting a meal or uh, like uh, even finding a job. But we wanted to figure out what it was that made long-term kind of concentration of poverty, long-term degradation of Detroit a problem, and we wanted to intervene there. And one of the things that we had to fight constantly were requests for us to do things like put our money into food banks. And um, some of our um, partners who were working very diligently in community development work actually stopped doing the community development work to become a, a food pantry. And they would feed 40,000 people a month, and they felt betrayed if we didn't give them money. And I didn't give them money. Because I said, I'm sorry, but that giving somebody a meal is not going to get you to the root of the problem, because we need to get them a job. We need to get the, the city kind of moving again. 
We also thought that we should be working in collaboration among experts and citizens, that we need to involve a diverse set of community stakeholders, especially the private sector, and we need to take a long view. And only philanthropy can really afford to take the long view. So steps along the way, we also then developed and presented our strategy with these clear objectives, a defensible logic, specific activities that we would uh, take, and shorten medium-term indicators to measure progress towards our goals. And then what did we do? We participated in some bold long-term aspirations. The first public transportation investment in Detroit in over 60 years, the M1 Rail, was uh, led by our partner, Kresge Foundation, and we invested in it as well. It uh, actually amassed about $120 million of philanthropic investment to actually put public transportation in the Motor City, which is not a small task. We, uh, among uh, 16 other funders, participated in a $100 million pooled fund to support the New Economy Initiative, which was, to, which was to transform the way Detroit thought about itself, to move away from being just an automotive city, but to, to find a way to spur innovation, entrepreneurship, and build new small businesses that could actually diversify the economic base. And um, we invested in a regional economic development plan that would involve the citizens in actually thinking about what their vision of the city should be 20, 30, 40 years out. So then we can begin to actually get a plan that would have buy-in broadly. And the, we pursued some very short-term and medium-term goals responding directly to the vacant, abandoned, and foreclosed property problem by creating a thing called a land bank which could actually become kind of a public-private entity that could manage vacant properties to public benefit, as opposed to letting them fall into the hands of investors and just uh, sit there and you know, inflict blight on the city. We built capacity in the civic sector uh, and in key NGOs uh, through investing in talent that we brought from outside of Detroit into Detroit through um, a partnership with Wayne State University. And we also uh, built capacity of local government through that same partnership where we placed 30 mid-career professionals from all over the United States into local government to actually be able to build the capacity of local government to get things done because 50 years of losing population had led, left a government that was incapable of actually managing itself. And finally, we engage a local population in vision and planning, including building their own capacity to be planners. And that's the last thing I'll talk about here uh, because one of the things we uh, thought was that um, we needed a plan, but we needed a plan that didn't come from the top down and say how we're going to repurpose land in Detroit, how we're going to reimagine the city. And we thought that it was more likely that the city is going to survive in the long run if we actually got buy-in and active participation of the citizens in it. And we spent a couple of million dollars and the Kresge Foundation matched a couple of million dollars to do the Detroit Works Project, which went out and worked with 10,000 residents of Detroit to come up with a long-term plan for Detroit. And it wasn't civic engagement in the old model of civic engagement where you just go to the community, ask them what they want, and you write it down. And then you go and you share it with the planners and you come back a month later and tell them what you're going to give them. This is actually uh, training the citizens in what planning meant, which is making hard choices in a constrained environment. And understanding that doing nothing comes at a severe cost. So um, one of the things that we did was we, um, we worked with them, and they produced the six project goals you see in front of you, which all were summarized in raising the quality of life for all, but increasing job and economic growth in the city, creating a city that is operationally efficient, defining new models for livable and healthy communities, fostering innovation in the productive use of land and infrastructure. These weren't ours, although it would have been nice. I mean, you, you could imagine a process in which we would have gotten to those same uh, conclusions. But this came out of um, hundreds and hundreds of meetings with thousands of people who then, it was summarized into this. And um, it was all also based on very, very sound research, which you know, looked at population trends and said, this is where we are now, and this is what will happen if we don't do things. So for example, when we, when we projected out the population trends, we realized that the current ratio of Detroit's population to its employment was four to one, and it was getting worse. And if we didn't do something about it, only 6,000 of 300,000 jobs that were going to be added in, in Detroit in the next 20 years in the Detroit metro would, hit, would happen in the city. The rest would happen outside. Well, they looked at uh, problems with vacant property. 80,000 vacant housing units in 2010. What were they going to do with all this vacant property? How were they going to repurpose it? And they had to confront the fact that doing nothing was not an option because 
they were destroying their ability to manage themselves because of the way tax revenues were dim diminishing as the occupied properties were also diminishing. And uh, we uh, brainstormed with them on ways that we could uh, actually respond differently with new policies that would actually prevent the, the, the degradation of the city and find ways to accelerate kind of more productive reuse. And we also did, um, you know, with our public, uh, private sector partners, we did market analyses to, to actually find ways to target public and private investment. Because we said Detroit is too big a city to fix all at once. We had to focus our efforts, we had to build on strength, and we did that. And we actually ended up deciding that we we're going to work on a T that goes along the river and out along the one corridor. And if I had a pointer, I would show you. Um, well, I'll, I'll show you right here. start there and it will create a contagion and we can build out from there. And then finally we uh, worked on guiding principles for the whole thing and how economic growth would actually take place with the blessing of 10,000 citizens who engaged in the process. And then we also talked about some out of the box ideas and these are some out of the box ideas that I think that um, maybe uh, some Greek foundations might want to think about. Um, the one that we already talked about was building the local capacity through embedded talent that we imported and we organized through a local university and we embedded them directly in, in uh, agencies uh, in the uh, local government and we embedded them in NGOs. And then, um, and one of the things that the German Marshall Fund is doing, uh, through partnership with federal agencies, they're going to bring uh, also fellows from federal agencies into the city to help them to do their job better. And then through training the local population to be better planners. And the making the big generational investments I already talked about. But the other idea is kind of crowdsourcing local interventions. I don't know if you've heard about this, but with Kiva and others, we've now been able to use technology to find ways to grow small pools of money to do really important things locally. And the, the most uh, interesting one that I've run into most recently is a thing called IOBY. I-O-B-Y, it says, in our backyard. And what they do is they find ways to, uh, to source projects that are going to happen in backyards and they get local people to contribute. And the final idea, and this is one that's really outside of the box, but I think it's yeah, very interesting, is the development of local currencies. And I'll just talk to you about this briefly. Local currencies are very useful in a time when the social compact has fallen apart. We have lots of productive resources, but you have no ability for the productive resources to find a way to meet and barter. And so in, the, in England in the 1980s, they created the thing called the local economy trading system, the LET system, which is a way to actually clear accounts on barter. And the way they would clear accounts is by trading human work hours. And so uh, what they would do is they would say you're a gardener and you would trade with your friend who is a beautician to that your friend will cut your hair and you will um, uh, fix their yard and you'll trade in hours. But this is a system that's based now on a local currency and they have local currencies all over the world. In fact, we have one um, in Detroit and this is called uh, Detroit Cheer. That's, a, that's the actual currency that they're using now, trading in Detroit. And I checked, and there's at least six local currencies now in use in Greece. Uh, and, and some of them are actually backed by real assets. And one of the things foundations could talk about is actually being kind of the central bank backing some local currencies if you want to begin to create economic activity in places with 25% unemployment and stifled uh, activity because there's no money to actually uh, trade hands. All right, so uh, those are my ideas. The conclusions are the same, except for the last, which is philanthropy can go where government and the private sector cannot, and you always have to remember that. You have to preserve the independence and the ability of the foundations to be nimble and entrepreneurial, and you can't take on governmental roles. We don't have the resources, and once you get in, you never get out if you take on kind of governmental uh, responsibilities. So. Those are my thoughts, and I'm going to turn it over now to our panelists, and I guess you guys are going to come up here to speak, right? Okay. Thank you, George. Thank you all. Good afternoon, and thank you very much to the Nyarkos Foundation for inviting us to, for organizing this meeting, and also for inviting us to participate. 
this is in Spain at least the siesta time. So it's a difficult time to speak. No? For the Germans, this is one of the problems of Spain, no? the siesta itself as a concept. Well, let's, <laughs> let's try to, to, to use this time. I'm going to use just 10 minutes to, to share some ideas, and afterwards we will have the, the discussion. No? What I'm going to do is to share with you some criteria, I think there are three, four criteria that we think could be useful to face from the point of view of foundation the, the crisis. These are some criteria that after a long and deep discussion uh, serve us to find some peace internally in our foundation in the sense that we are using our money in a proper way. At the end, this is an ethic, a moral question. No? Do are we getting out the most that we come from our money? So we did just like a kind of checklist. What should we do always? First, and I think that this is happening in all the Spanish foundations. I don't know if this is happening in other countries. We, are, we want to swift. We want to change from the concept of giving to the concept of doing, not granting anymore. We don't, we, we don't want to be an endowment foundation that grants other managing foundations. We want to be both a managing foundation and endowment foundation. And why not even to ask for grants to other foundations? So I think that this is the first question to redefine. Are you an endowment foundation or are you a managing? No, you are both things. And we have a, a really um, a special way of, of, of listening to society that we can use to act as we know that it has to be done, no? as, as you were saying somehow. No? So let's switch from giving to doing. Um, in doing, how? No? The, the first thing that I think that we have to look for in these times is to find a balance. I will not say the balance, but a balance because it is different for every uh, institution between responding to urgent new needs related with the crisis and investment in basic long-term programs for the future. And the balance has to be found. As I said, it, it is going to be different for every institution. It is important to work for the long term, but it is also very, very important to show the society that we are not just looking for the future, that we are not independent, that we are not looking to another part, that we know what is happening in the, in the, in the door in front of us. We at least are trying to find this balance, so at the same time we invest in science for the, for the very, very, very long term, but we run a new uh, program to, to find talented people that came out of the workforce and that you can, we can use them to develop new um, programs and new activities in the third, in the social sector, for example. So at least you show, you show that you know what's happening. But on the other side, you stick in your programs for the long term because it will be very, very dangerous if we take the money out of what we know that will work in the future to solve social needs that arise right now. Um, second, in doing, I think that we have to explore new ways of doing new things. At least as in the foundation, we will never do something that it's already been doing. Because we think that first, what, what is happening in this crisis is that the model does not work. It is the model itself. We don't know how we are going to create wealth in the future in Europe. We know that it is not going to be in the same way that we did it in the past. It's the only thing we know. So always to, to push ourselves, to, to be sure to have attention, to do things in new ways, and to do new things in new ways. But this which could be called in a more simple way to be innovative. You have, or we think that we have to do it, both for the urgent needs and both for the long term. But you can only do that if you do two other things. First, if you dare 
to measure. I, I don't say if you commit with measuring the social impact. I say there to measure, because if you measure in a proper way, it can happen that after three years, you realize that it didn't work. And you have to be prepared to say, okay, it didn't work. We lose our money, maybe not. But, but if you explore new ways of doing new things and you don't measure, you are throwing away the money. For measuring, I will not be too preoccupied about the accuracy of the measuring model. Because the problem, no, no, no one measures because it's so difficult to measure the impact of our education. I don't care about the accuracy. I care about the tension that gives you to measure something. At least you have something. To, you have a red light that turns on when you are throwing away the money. Hmm? You, so, new things, new ways, measuring, and another thing is that innovating, but at the end not using as a prime matter anything that you already don't have. I will be very, uh, I think it's too risky to find wonderful ideas. Someone said something similar in the last workshop. Wonderful ideas in, in everyone. Haven't you realized that there are two things that everyone in Spain wants to build? A Palo Alto, a Silicon Valley. We are going to build Silicon Valley in Andalusia. No, or in Andalusia, or here in, in Greece, whatever. And a Guggenheim. No? These are the two things that always everyone wants to build. And you have to be sure that you work with your prime matter, with the talent that you already have. We in the foundation believe that only one person with creating talent has this magic capacity of creating, of helping something to happen. No? So we at the end don't do nothing which is not looking for talent and betting on talent. And this is compatible to do new things in new ways. OK. Third, uh, first was finding the balance or I balance. Second was exploring the new ways to do new things. The third one will be to be prepared to redefine. You were saying, George, on not doing things that the state does or that the state used to do. I don't know if it is that clear, because now in Europe, there are thousands of people in the administration, in the public administration area, taking out from lists things that they were used to do in education, in health, in, in basic services. Who is going to do that? In our cult, maybe no one, because it wasn't needed. But what if it was needed and the state did it because no one else did it? It is so different what is done by the state in the States and Europe. Wealthy people in Europe is going to realize that they are needed even for the basic. It's not a gain for the basic education, for the basic health services. This is going to happen in Spain, I'm sure. So it is the moment to redefine. One of the things that is going to change, but for sure, with this crisis in Europe, is the borders between the state and the civil society. Because the state is going to change. It is changing here, in Spain, in France, in Italy. What is going to happen with this huge gap? So at the end, I would say, I will look for the gaps. I would look for my capacities. I would, look to, I would try to be sure that we are using the, our prime matters, that we are innovating, and I will bet there what I think I can. We are doing something which is quite new in Spain, in, in the Botin Foundation. We are, even if the law tells us that we can't, we are um, building new companies that we are owning. We own the first three companies. Uh, there is one, we own the 65%, another one the 55%. Uh, we are owning the companies to be sure that we convert in services or products, innovations, that grows in the laboratories of the best researchers in Spain. The law tells you that you cannot use 70% of your budget for social purposes to um, participate in a company. But we are doing it. Because we think that a company that 
transfers the knowledge from the laboratory has a huge social impact. It's a social end in the same way that the others. So I think that we have to be ready to redefine what foundations are and what foundations do. And I'm ending. This is all the, this, this short, very short checklist. It's just to assure two things. I think that we have to look for two ends. First, to be sure that we are getting the, the maximum social productivity, if we can speak in that sense, of our money, that we are getting the most social impact of our investment, and both, which is even more important, that we are really doing something that we all say that this crisis can be also an opportunity. It will be, I mean, we, we have, we are going to redefine, even if we don't know that we are doing. So I think that these three things, or we at least find peace, I don't want to say that we are sure that we at least find peace in these three criteria to be sure that we are taking the most of our money and that we are doing things that will help to build a new model, a new relationship between third sector, private sector and the state that can work in Europe. Because the one that we had five years ago, it is not going to work anymore. And this is for sure. Okay, I wanted maybe to, be, to give some examples or so, but I think it's better to, to, to leave it for the discussion. So thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I'd also like to uh, begin by applauding the Niarcos Foundation for this uh, timely initiative. Uh, nothing can replace these kinds of face-to-face -face meetings so that those of us who are not from Greece can fully understand the narrative, the individual stories, the challenges, and of course the questions that arise from a situation like this. And so the fact that uh, Andreas and his team and Jerry and his team have put this together is, is really a, a, a most welcome and it's a pleasure to be in this uh, wonderful country. So everything that I will say in these 10 minutes uh, is with Greece on my mind. And I come here with, as all of us, uh, different identities and many hats, but I'll speak about uh, from under two hats. Um, I am from this region, a little further north, in a, from a country called Serbia. And uh, that will be my first story. And then I'll talk with my other American hat uh, with a foundation that has a German component, the German Marshall Fund of the United States, and how we work across borders and try to help uh, others in achieving uh, civility, responsibility, and accountability. Um, my first hat um, is, a, is an even more tragic story than the one of this country. Um, I was brought up in a generation in Europe that uh, war should never happen again, at least in Europe. And yet my country that no longer exists, called Yugoslavia, has uh, vanished. It no longer exists. And uh, it is one of the most difficult experiences uh, to experience war, of course, and to experience loss of country. And so I use this metaphor of having lived in a six-room apartment and now I'm in a one-room apartment. And so when you travel to other parts of your former country, it feels very strange because this was yours, not yours anymore. You have friends everywhere. And so you have to have a moment uh, of pause uh, philosophically. Um, you can use the Greek word catharsis and realize what happened, that, that there was evil done in your name. And of course, the ultimate evil is war, but there's also evil in abusing institutions, uh, in abusing the way that the Constitution is used, the way that, in fact, a state and a society work together, or what political parties are for. And uh, we have had to go through this extremely difficult experience. It, it's not easy to look at yourself in the mirror and realize that uh, somehow you were also part of this evil that happened. Uh, of course, those who were making decisions were part of it, but society also had something to do with this. Uh, I was part of an opposition movement uh, in the 80s under communism already, but we weren't able to stop this. And so you have to ask yourself, why aren't you able to stop something that is obvious to you? You see that you know, someone's going down the road wrong path, or someone's abusing an institution, or some 
uh, corrupt um, uh, p person at the Ministry of Infra Infrastructure is taking a bribe. I mean, it's not that people were not aware in my country or in this country of the level of corruption. And yet, we were unable to stop something that then accumulated and burst like a bubble. So, and I follow the previous panel and uh, what uh, Ingrid said earlier. Uh, it's obviously about politics, it's about democracy, and it's about whether people are actually empowered to say more than just every four years at the ballot box. Because democracy obviously has this important moment every four years in elections, but I would say it's more important actually what we do the day after and throughout all those days leading up to the next election. Because if that voice is not heard and that awareness does not come to the fore, then we reach the kind of uh, uh, abyss uh, that uh, my country uh, reached. And thus, we have had to actually look at ourselves and, and think. And the, the thought that comes to mind is, is of the German philosopher Kant, who tried to explain what enlightenment was, what was the understanding of the world of oneself and of the individual, an empowered individual, and he had a very simple answer to the question, what is the enlightenment? He said, it is the exit from self-inflicted immaturity. And I think that captures it very well. We have to become mature. It's not easy to grow up. Um, the Nearcos Foundation is going to be adult <laughs> in two years, but it's really acting in an adult way even as a teenager. And I think that what foundations can do is really to help uh, this enlightenment, this actually acquiring of skills, of understanding the uh, way in which uh, institutions uh, work. And the way that uh, the German Marshall Fund went about this, and this is how I joined in 2003, when they decided to create a cross-border private-public partnership that was American at origin, and then joined by the Europeans called the Balkan Trust for Democracy. The mission statement was very simple, linking citizens to government. And the other part of it was regional cooperation, i.e. understanding that if citizens are not part and parcel of governmental policies, you can't move forward. And so a lot of our work over these, it's in its 10th year now, and that was very important, as others have said, understanding that you need to take the long view, whether in a city like Detroit or in a country or a region like the Balkans or, for that matter, in Greece. Uh, one cannot solve anything overnight. One cannot do anything in an instant. And that famous long march begins with those first steps. And here the steps were very simple explaining to people at a municipal level how they can become engaged in defining the municipal budget. Do they want this road paved or do they want the school painted? Or do they want more trees in the park? It's a program the World Bank has heralded for many years, municipal budgeting. But you need to get the citizens to actually be there to sit and discuss with their elected officials and see that they are accountable uh, to what they're doing. We have given a thousand grants over these uh, 10 years. The average grant is anywhere between 10 and 20 thousand dollars, so it's not a very big amount, but it goes a long way. And we are a small donor. I mean, there's a humility in knowing that you're small and you, that you need to work with others. In fact, if you work with others, it multiplies the effects uh, of what you do. Uh, for example, as you know, the European Union, when it gives grants, often asks the grantee that it find the 10 remaining percent of a 100 percent grant. In our countries, there's simply no money for something like that. Where will a small social NGO looking at street children, for example, find 10 percent of a big grant? So we have been the ones often who have found that 10 percent in our budget, so the, a grant uh, of social importance could, could go forward. And so we have replicated this model, and American initiative was important here because it was USAID, the German Marshall Fund, and the Mott Foundation from Flint, Michigan, who created the trust of $25 million for, 12, uh, for 10 years. Um, I and my colleagues worked very hard, and we were joined by five European governments uh, who added money to the trust from private European foundations who joined the trust, 
and so it became a transatlantic private-public partnership. Uh, this is a model uh, that has shown its value, its results. Uh, it has been heralded. We replicated the model five years later in the Black Sea region. Uh, an office based in Bucharest is doing the same thing around with all the Black Sea countries. And actually, we are now putting forward a proposal for the uh, North Africa Middle East region, uh, a MENA trust. Because I think as we look at our own problems, it's not that the other problems haven't gone away. And in fact, North Africa is the immediate neighborhood, uh, not only of this country, but of Europe, of the whole of Southern Europe, and of Europe as a whole for that matter. And I think that even in dire times, as we are trying to solve our own problems, I think it helps to realize that others have even bigger problems. Not that we can all do something for them, but I think if there's a, an awareness of this, I think we, we're able to find ways in which we can uh, solve our issues um, as well. I spent a brief uh, but very intense year uh, in government uh, with uh, the late Prime Minister Zoran Djindic of Serbia in 2002-2003. He was the one who was unfortunately assassinated in March of 2003. And as a political scientist uh, in a prior life who taught about transition and uh, democracy and, and politics, the one thing that I learned uh, in that one year in government was very humbling, and that is that in any transition, as the one that we had been in Serbia after a war and conflict, you're juggling about 30 balls at the same time, and you're trying to catch up all the lost time. And it's not dissimilar to a situation of deep crisis as the one in Greece here. And of course, all the balls cannot be flying at the same time. Some will drop. But that, that is not reason to, be, uh, reason to be discouraged. In fact, I think it gives you greater courage to move forward and to tackle some of the key issues that actually may allow for openings in resolving these issues. Um, as many have said, the relationship between democracy and civil society is key. But a, a Frenchman called Tocqueville, in his definition, added political society along with civil society and the state. And I think it's very important, although foundations, I think, uh, have difficulty in addressing the, the whole sphere of politics and political parties, although we do know that there are very valuable works by the German political foundations by NDI and IRI in the US who have been helping, but there needs to be something that looks at the way uh, political parties actually go about their business, because somewhere here is a kernel of uh, problems that in many of our countries we do have. Um, there is no democracy with political parties, so let's not fantasize about the disappearance of political parties. They are here to stay. It is the way that elections are adjudicated but there must be something in which, in, uh, in some ways in which we can address this. And as someone else said this morning, uh, this is an unattractive field for many young people who are professionals. There has been a degradation of the image of politics. And so, to put it in a nutshell, there needs to be a redignification of politics. How that occurs, of course, is a question that's difficult to answer for any of us, but I'd just like you to Bear that in mind uh, as we think forward. And then very briefly, just to mention two more things in which uh, ways we are working in a transatlantic dimension between uh, Europe and the United States is one that George mentioned. Uh, we are actively involved in a, an urban and regional program, uh, the example that George mentioned, but we're looking at one called Cities in Transition or cities in decline. So we've taken mid-level cities throughout Europe that have uh, a number of urban problems, uh, either because of industrial decline or because of population decline, and we have been bringing mayors from the two sides of the Atlantic, and uh, it's been incredible how exciting these encounters are and how much uh, they learn from each other. So we're building up uh, on, on this experience. There's the fellowship that was mentioned. But we have had for 30 years a fellowship program that was generously supported by the Nyarkos Foundation for a span of 10 years. 
and that is to bring Europeans to the U.S. to spend a month there in a sort of visitor's program uh, for basically building understanding. Um, and I've met many Greeks who have been part of this, and uh, whether you're a Greek or a Portuguese or a Dane whom I've met, we have about 2,000 alumni, one of the first sentences when they hear that I'm from the German Marshall Fund, they said this was an incredibly uh, defining experience in their lives. And we have been bringing Americans uh, to uh, Europe for the past 15 years. And this is the kind of long-term um, foundational type of work that I think you don't see the obvious results immediately. Uh, they are long-term results because these are people you can call upon or who will help in certain situations to translate what is happening because they have been, for example, to Thessaloniki or it's their first trip to Europe and they will go back and explain that Europe is not this Venice, you know, where you go for a siesta and a good meal, but there are actually people working, producing, uh, doing things, having hardships. And so we continue uh, in this vein. Finally, there's a lot of work uh, done on support to think tanks because without independent policy thinking, I don't think we will be able to address some of these burning policy programs that governments and societies have. Yes, governments do have their policy units, they have their planning staff, but I think if you're not working outside, you're not really totally free. And we need, of course, to put these people together. So we have a, uh, what we call a Euro Future Project. We're trying to look uh, from a transatlantic perspective what, what it means globally uh, but in particular for the U.S., what is happening in, in Europe itself. Because this is about Europe. This is not only about Greece, however important it is for those living here. And um, so I conclude by saying that um, with a quote from, from Isaiah Berlin, again, uh, someone who's, who's a European by all, born, born in Riga, uh, before the Russian Revolution, moved to Britain and became a philosopher there who in trying to define what a responsible government was, uh, I think found a very, very pregnant uh, and very succinct definition. He said, a responsible government is one that avoids the extremes of suffering. Now, my government didn't avoid that. It took us to war. And uh, I think that's a, a fair measure of the complete failure of, of that government. Uh, here, I think, uh, extreme sufferings can be translated in the type of austerity that is being demanded on, on, on the people of Greece. And I think governments should have thought beforehand, 10, 20 years ago, what would be the consequences of a clientelistic, nepotistic, corrupt system. Uh, it all looked fine until a few years ago, and I come to Greece every summer and have been coming here. I have a lot of friends, and uh, it was a surprise. Although in the cafe talks in the evenings, you would hear all these stories, and yet there were no uh, ways in which the uh, political elite and the people in society would address this. So I leave you with the fact that uh, my country is still uh, believing in Europe. Uh, it, we are a candidate state moving forward uh, and uh, hoping to join uh, what we believe is uh, a better uh, scenario to be a member of a club of half a billion people rather than to be a country of seven and a half million that we are outside of this family, whatever the troubles of that family may be. Thank you very much. So I want to thank Inigo and Ivan uh, for very thoughtful comments. And um, in a moment, we're going to turn uh, to you to engage with our thoughtful commentarians here. Um, but in, first, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. And I'm also going to beseech the audience, I noticed that in the other panels that I attended today that people got up to ostensibly ask a question but didn't ask a question. They just made a long statement, right? So I want you to think about it before you get the microphone. Engage in a dialogue. Don't just do a monologue, okay? So um, I don't want to put a chilling effect. I'm sure there's many people here who want to get to the microphone. But let's try to make a dialogue between uh, you and our panel. So. Um, while you're thinking about your questions, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. One of the things that occurred to me uh, as we were, um, as I was listening to these two presentations and um, trying to listen to my own, um, was that uh, one of the things that we're really talking about here is um, the provision of public goods. And I think what we're 
we're, we're now kind of on the cusp of a, of a world in which um, the provision of public goods might be done in a very different way um, than they were in the past. Uh, generally, we relied on government to find ways to provide public goods. And I think maybe we need a whole kind of new theory of public goods. But Inigo, it, it occurred to me that um, you, you have an idea that philanthropy can actually play an active role in the provision of public goods. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about your idea of building new companies uh, that convert new products. Is that a way to cross-subsidize the provision of other public goods? Or is that the actual production of public goods through a private corporation? Thank you, George. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if there is a, a concept, a definition of public good that we all share. We are working in education. If you ask someone in Spain who's the responsible for the quality of education, he will tell you the state. But we are working with the public schools to improve the academic records, and not only at the academic records of the schools, by introducing the development of creativity and social and emotional intelligence in the curriculum. Is this a public good or not? Well, it's a public school. We are collaborating with the public sector, with the public administration, but we think that this, if this cannot be done by the public administration, we can do it, and we are sure that we are getting a social impact, then, if, we, if you can go and go and do it. We are, I mean, we, we found after 10 years working with some of the best researchers in biomedicine in Spain, that little by little, they began to, um, to, to localize inventions, um, uh, discoveries that could, that could come to the market, that could, um, that could be converted in products or services. But we found that the way, I mean, the point where the researchers can bring their projects is not the point where the industry or the, or the money has to find them to invest. There is a gap of trust, there is a gap of money, there is a gap of culture. So we realize what we are doing is that we are investing half a million by project, maximum two years. After two years, we come out to bring these inventions, these projects, to the market, to convert them in industries, in companies, so someone can, bring, can come and put some money. Is this something that the private sector should do? Maybe yes, but for the private sector, it's too risky. We, we, we want to be sure that we are investing in projects that really can make it. We know, because, because in Spain, there is no uh, there is no risk invention uh, in, in, in investing, as it happens in the States, for example. So in one case is the, is the task of the public sector, in another one would be the task of the private sector, and we are in both. We think that we are doing well because we, we can do it, we are measuring. I, I don't know, I don't know what do you think? But, so, but I guess the question I have is, or there's, I have several questions. One is, are you creating something in that process which would be construed as a public good, and that would be why you would have philanthropic engagement in the first place, right? Or is this something that could be just entirely provided by the, the private market? Because one of the dangers of the private market taking over the provision of public goods is that they essentially become a monopoly, and it's very difficult then to kind of control how that public good is distributed. So for example, in the Chicago case, when a private uh, company came and took over the, the parking meters in, in Chicago, they were able to kind of set their own price and people had to live with it and there was no control over that space when it, once it was privatized, right? But now what you're talking about is kind of a partnership between kind of a philanthropic enterprise and a, and a, a private corporation to develop something that ostensibly actually has a strong public benefit and you're just you're making sure that it actually gets to market and it wouldn't get to market otherwise without your investment, is that? Yeah, yeah. yeah that, maybe in that sense we are not delivering public goods. We are doing something else. We are, we are putting in practice processes, dynamics, that at the end will produce development. The only thing that I'm saying is that we, you have to mix to, to um, the, the private, public, social, our concepts, that I think they're mixing each other and I don't know, the borders are not that clear and I think that's good. Mm -hmm. 
so Ivan, jump in here if you want to talk yeah. about the just, public goods, because I have another question for you. Yeah, ju just, uh, just a few words, I think. And uh, then we have, we have uh, Jerry, you want the mic? In, in, yeah, okay, there's a, we need a mic down here at some point. Oh, there, yeah, and another one, okay, go ahead. Uh, someone in, in the previous panel, or, or one this morning, said, uh, I think, so, something that holds true, and that is that uh, if, if we know anything, and that is that nothing will be the same, in the sense that the state uh, clearly, over the past 20 years, have be, has been deleveraging a lot of its uh, public good obligations uh, onto uh, others. Uh, at a discussion at the London School of Economics, someone was giving the example of, of medicine and this dispensation of, of hospital goods and said, for example, you take a diabetes pen patient today, uh, the diabetes pa patient does 90% of the work, you know, measuring their own. Uh, blood sugar count, uh, determining how much they have to take insulin, taking the insulin, and so that, that's, I think, a, a telling example of, of, uh, of what and how the responsibility is being put onto either individuals or, or society. Now, I, I think what, what Inigo was saying, uh, and that's why I believe it's a public good, what the Foundation is doing, it's, it's lubricating a system or, or putting uh, uh, communication tools where they don't exist between uh, the private and the creator. Uh, and, and the creator obviously cannot also be a manager and a seller and, uh, and someone who can uh, test out what the market exactly needs from, from the invention. So is this the ideal? I don't know, but thank God that there is a foundation who in this particular case can advance and create those synapses that, that are not there. So there, there's a different kind of public good, and there's a thing called the public bad, right? Uh, negative externalities, whatever else. And maybe one of the worst public bads that we confront all the time is corruption. It's like a cancer. And I'm, and I'm wondering, uh, Yvonne, what are your thoughts about how can philanthropy kind of engage in ways to kind of derail uh, or overcome corruption so that we can actually kind of restabilize a, a public sector to actually provide the kinds of things that need to be provided for the community? Well, obviously, to state uh, something uh, clearly is that this is a, a huge topic and uh, there are no immediate solutions, but I'll answer the question through an example of what we did uh, as a foundation and as this Balkan Trust for Democracy, uh, and it came from, from the ground. It came from Romania. It was a coalition of about 25 NGOs, and the project was called a Coalition for a Clean Parliament. And what they did was they, to put it simply, vetted candidates that were being fielded by political parties to uh, the parliamentary elections. And they did it sort of, how, how can I say, it was not a public, um, it was not a, a, a public procedure in the first instance. They told parties, we are going to go out through a very serious and rigorous process to find out how people see the candidates who are being fielded. And they said, we'll produce a list of those whom we believe are corrupt, that your party is you know, filing a, a candidate who is corrupt. We will give you the list, and then we will allow you to take them off. If you don't take them off, we will go public with the list. And uh, lo and behold, this was a very successful project, and it's been now used as a model uh, for other countries. And actually, l most of the parties took most of the candidates off those lists. And uh, I think it's a, it's a good and small example where the public actually, through a process, and again, they were very rigorous not to just have a neighbor accuse someone of being corrupt. They, they actually went and, and studied this. Um, I think there are, a lot of, there, there are actually maybe too many anti-corruption projects out there from all the instances, and it's not all about corruption. I think my, my friend and our friend Ivan Krastev from Bulgaria wrote a book about this, that you, know, you want to look at this uh, within a broader framework of political institutions and a systemic approach. But I think there are ways to address this, and, and whistleblowing, and there are a number of... Uh, NGOs out there now who are actually doing this on a regular basis. Uh, the question is, you know, do the governments then take up the whistleblowers' um, initiative? Yeah. Yes, sure. In you go. Yeah, something about that. I think other thing that we should do, I mean, because I think that we have to face the question of the government, of corruption, and not only corruption. I think the, Marcus said before 
that it's frustrating why it's so difficult to bring good people to politics. No? And uh, I think we have to face corruption before it occurs. We have to bring good people. I mean, we are, for example, doing in, the, in Latin America a program we call for the strength of the public sector. We are detecting with the universities, the best people in universities, there are 700 universities presenting people that have a public vocation, 20 years old. And we are putting all them together, people with wonderful academic records that have this strange vocation to engage with the public sector in their countries. They believe that they can do a difference from the public sector. We are putting them together, we train them with Brown University, we are doing a wonderful program. They come to Spain, they go back, they do initiatives, and we are trying to achieve that some of the best, at least some of the best, finally come to the public sector, to the political parties, to the government, because if not, it's gonna be impossible. Yeah, it's, so it's not just the corruption in the public sector, it's also kind of incompetence as well that you want yeah. to be able to, and you want to be able to elevate the, the quality of the jobs. I was stunned when I well, the first went to Detroit to find out that um, uh, for several years running, uh, Detroit was returning to the federal government about $100 million of unspent subsidy because they couldn't figure out a way to use it. I said, how is it possible in a place like Detroit that has 80,000 vacant buildings that you couldn't find a way to spend $100 million of of public subsidy. So, Jerry, what do you got for us? I'm not sure I have a question. Oh, you better have a question, Jerry. Come on. <laughs> I'm, back. I'm sorry. I don't have a question. I am going to, but I will dialogue with the panel. Okay, good, okay. good. Um, my, I think you may have actually missed the fact that this has been one of the most dialogue full conversations in the last couple of days. So, you missed some back and forth that you didn't see. So, just to put you in the picture there. But I, 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 I want to, to, to say that, I, I'm first of all, on the corruption issue, I'm not 100% sure what we're talking about is always corruption or whether, in fact, it's not really a, a rec not recognizing very different ways of getting around to the same thing. And frankly, Europe's philanthropic infrastructure is very old and is very closely interrelated with a clientelistic uh, way of working, which is very subtle. I mean, so, so the idea that you can sort of talk about anti-corruption in crisp, clean uh, lines is actually complicated because philanthropy itself is, is a cultural response. And I was particularly struck, actually, by Inyo, your, your, your comment, well, you know, it's illegal, we're not allowed to do this, we're doing it anyway. My experience of European foundations is that they're forever actually on the cutting edge. They are having to do new things. They're having to operate out of the box and in very different ways. And sometimes the terminology isn't right. So it's really quite interesting to hear people say, wait a minute, what is that? Is that really philanthropy when it's something like closer to, you know, uh, I don't know, in, uh, an investment? Uh, how people operate in terms of the relationship between business and philanthropy, the re very close relationship that there is between government and philanthropy, all leads you into a situation that actually the back and forth between institutions is, is, is much more, is less clear, it's less clear and is much more uh, um, nuanced than it is in the United States. And so but, but you would agree that, that it is a, f a goal, or it could be a goal of philanthropy to make government more effective whether it's more effective because it's less corrupt or because it's more kind of co competent. And then, and, and philanthropy very often has to kind of tread very carefully when trying to do that. But I have to say that in times of economic crisis, uh, the failure of government is usually profound, right? It, it and, and, and precisely because some institutions have been in existence for a very long time, they have weathered very different regimes and have had to develop strategies in those different contexts that actually look different at different times. And so my, my, my problem here is that we are trying to fit into a very modern philanthropy box, a set of institutions that have thrived by flying under the radar 
operating, uh, uh, inventing themselves, reinventing themselves, camouflaging themselves sometimes in, in different contexts. And so that's, that's one of the problems because philanthropy actually is a very versatile, adaptive tool that people have had to live with and have had to use. And it, they're very, it's, it's really civil society at its best. It's creative, mm -hmm. it's new, it breaks new ground. And because of that, it's hard to put in boxes. Then come, of course, the wonderful strategists and analysts, and they say, well, you're not in the right box. And that's the problem. Now we have one over here. Um, so thanks for the, for the speeches. I have just one uh, question to Inigo. I, I think you, you didn't mean it in that way, but there is one point when you called, uh, talked about uh, that you're just doing own innovations. I think, I think you don't thought, meant, uh, that it can be very innovative to take very successful models or, or programs over. We had the same in Germany and now we have a culture, some foundations, they just jump in after three years because they say, uh, we are sick of and tired of all these pilot programs and nobody's jumping in and some of the most innovation for <laughs> innovative foundations in Germany or organizations are exactly you uh, taking this gap and uh, by the programs which are developed on the best moment in my opinion and that could be very helpful. Look at all the programs we have been presented the last two days. I would buy some of them if I had to, would have the money to bring it to some places in Germany and to scale it. You know, so that's the first point and just you can make that perhaps a little bit more clear. And the second about uh, very concrete about uh, the corruption point. I think the, the internet did a lot of interesting stories and, and foundations could support. For example, we support Parliament Watch. It's an internet platform which, which make public all the internet sites of, of uh, and uses the internet sites of parliamentarians. Yes, they have to be in the internet, our parliamentarians in all levels. And they work with that transparency. They use it, they activate it, and they activate people, and they make, they make visible, for example, for which company a parliamentarian is working. And you can see that. This, just this is a, a very good point. And in India, I know a very successful uh, social enterprise uh, and internet company. It's called uh, I, paid, I Paid the Bribe. Yeah, so they make visible who, who wanted to have a bribe. bribe. That, that's <laughs> a very, very nice uh, impact. You could see that in the internet. Thanks. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, obviously, I mean, but somehow I think that this is the moment to invent also. I don't know, I think that, and, and both things can be done at the same time. Our program, of our science program, we, we, br we, we bring it, we, we copy it from the Howard Hughes Foundation. We are using the Howard Hughes model to improve the capacity of transfer the technology from laboratories to society. But then we realized that something happened in Spain that had, I mean, that made this gap, this new gap that maybe does not exist in the States that needs something new. The, the, the social and intelligence emotional program that we are doing is a work by Major and Salloway in the States that they, they, that they use it for, for uh, for business, for adults, above all, and we found that this could be used for schools. We were the first in, in, in measuring and applying the development of social and emotional intelligence in the schools. But, but the, the, the methodologies did already exist. So I think it's a question of combination of both things, no? On the other side, the, the other comment about the um, business area, foundations, philanthropy, I think it's, I think as you as it's something we, we sometimes have an obsession to put names to things. I, I would like I, I would like to be sure that everything we do in the foundation it's good enough to be sell. We don't sell it. We give it away. But it has to be good enough to be sell. We, we want to, to make exhibition in art that we could ask for a ticket of ten dollars or to pay if you are in a school for our program. We are not, this is, a, at the end, is being the same thing with a different end, a, a different end, no? Yeah, uh, it, it's a question. Talking about, again, the role of, uh, of foundations. We talk about foundations even getting involved in, in basically saving, I mean, uh, fighting corruption in the state sector. My question is, it's a bit outside the box. The more active foundations become, and thus more, more, more powerful in a way. Who's gonna check 
on the foundations are, that foundations don't get corrupt. And it's, it's being corrupted by power, which is more dangerous than, than money. And so it's, you know, it's something which I think the foundation industry has to think about. Who's going to regulate us in a good way, not regulate <laughs> in, in a good way? Yeah. So maybe Jerry can also have a, some input on that. I think Jerry would like to regulate us. <laughs> so, you have thoughts about regulating foundations? Well, it's the uh, eternal philosophical question: who, who, who's the master? Who oversees the master? I mean, um, and it's it's a very serious question. I think that uh, if we are serious and uh, accountable to ourselves, we definitely have to have uh, that thought uh, as we get up and, and, uh, and go to bed and, and during the day. Uh, I, I think J Jerry's point is important that, you know, corruption does respond to dysfunctionalities in a system. So, you know, if you're a policeman who earns 50 euros a month and, can, and you have two children, then of course you'll try and stop someone at a, you know, at a curve in the road and, and get another 50 uh, uh, from that, and uh, I think that's been uh, one of the ways in which uh, kind of social programs, quote unquote, <laughs> have been conducted in a very per perverse and, and corrosive way. And uh, I think another way in which the corruption is being fought, and this goes to the European Union and to aspiring member states, is that of course this is a condition uh, for countries that are joining. So there's a conversion of the uh, demands of the acquis communautaire uh, with those uh, of, of society. Now the problem is, of course, those countries who are already members, you know, how do you regulate that? And their civil society, I think, has um, a voice at least, uh, but it needs, you know, strong ombudsmen, strong um, agencies, uh, that uh, can actually address those who are very powerful. Uh, you know, when you, when you talk to, uh, to people in America, and uh, you know, they're, 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 there's something, uh, sometimes a feeling that we smaller countries are held to higher standards than those in those countries. And of course, people will not neglect that there is corruption in a Chicago. But uh, to use the famous euphemism, it's at tolerable levels, whatever that may mean. So it's not pervasive in the whole system. And uh, there is a, a, a functioning and efficient government so that, whether it's at, at, a, at a state or, or local level. Um, and I think that the, the minimum to which one would aspire is to reach that tor tolerable, quote unquote, level whatever that may be. And I think that has to do with a feeling of citizens that they have a judicial system which actually works for them rather than against them. So the, the judiciary somehow, I would say, is a backbone in addressing those broader issues that, that we have talked about. Um, I have a question for um, our Spanish speaker. I was very interested in your idea of doing new things in new ways. And um, from my experience, this is something that is always true of the private sector, particularly in this country. It has always been the private sector that breaks new ground. And um, we have found that we sometimes had to convince ourselves and then to convince the government that certain things could be done. For, ex for, for example, that children with cerebral palsy could go beyond the stage of primary schools. So I would just like to ask you, if you have this experience in Spain of trying things out and then convincing the government that it can be done, trying out new ideas, inventing, as you have said, particularly in the area of education, and then convincing the government that it can be done and it should be done, and getting them to take on, for instance, just simple things like a gymnasium for children with disability. Thank you. Thank you. I think that the, the, the question is to measure to measure how much you invest in doing what you are doing, 
and to measure the impact that you are getting. If you measure it and you show it, I mean, if you have to convince the state, because maybe you don't have to convince the state, you can continue and go on and do your things. In the example that we are, in, you just spoke about education, in our educational program, we work in a region of Spain, which is Cantabria, in the north of Spain, with 100 schools. But now, in September, we will begin in Madrid. Because we had the demand of the schools, of the private schools and also public schools, of training the, 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 the staff of the schools to be able to run these kind of programs. And we are beginning in September, just because we explained how much we were putting in the program and what, were we, get, um, what we were getting out of the program with a collaboration of a university that was measuring the, the, the differences between the, a control group that we left out of our program and our program, and it comes alone. So, that, so that's an example of, of kind of how you use private sector mentality to change the, the way the government kind of behaves. But, you know, I wonder, one of the things that we always assert about the role of philanthropy in general, but particularly the role of philanthropy during economic crises, is that philanthropy has this kind of magical power to convene people and to convene people from different sectors to do things that they might not otherwise do. And so one of the conceits we have in philanthropy is that we can somehow get the private sector to do things that it wouldn't otherwise do. But I wonder how much of that is really true and how much of that is fantasy. Because um, at a meeting like this, I don't think we have a lot of private sector representation. Maybe, I haven't, maybe they just haven't been speaking up. Uh, Jerry, but maybe they, maybe they, they aren't here, right? Because philanthropy is always trying to figure out a way to get the private sector to behave differently. And I wonder, in, in you know, your experiences, um, where is it that philanthropy and the private sector meet? And then I'll give you an example from what I do that, that might also answer that same question. Well, let, let me kick it off briefly. Um, I think that uh, corporate social responsibility and, and the private sector are most successful in, you know, what, for lack of a better word, in, in soft projects. So helping social issues, uh, schools, fellowships, um, scholarships, uh, environmental issues. I think it's much tougher when you come to the kind of issues that we're addressing here, of, of, of a systemic kind of uh, trying to help, for example, think tanks, independent um, policy thinking, or you know advocacy projects uh, of of a call it anti-corruption or to get a law that would enable greater oversight and accountability, and I think that you know that's really something that we have to think of. Not that this has not been attempted, but I think that uh, the private sector and corporations steer away from what they deem I think are more sensitive issues, uh, especially in a in an environment of, uh, of a crisis. And um, uh, I've had conversations uh, with these people. They're f fully cognizant of the need to support those kinds of watchdog advocacy activities, but are very reluctant to engage in them. You know, I, mean, I, th I think we, we, we are quite the same thing. I mean, we, we work every day in an everyday basis with the private sector. We do it with the, in science, with the companies, with, with private schools, in education, with entrepreneurs in our rural development programs. We become ourselves entrepreneurs. As, as we said, at the end, we are doing the same thing. That the, the only difference is that we are not earning money from it. But we have to do things in this, in, somehow in the same way. And it happens something similar with the public sector. I don't uh, find this as a, as a problem. And if I look to my agenda, I'm working every day with people from the private sector and from the public sector even more than for the third sector or the social sector. Maybe this is one of the problems. Hmm? So the, um, the answer to my own question, because it was rhetorical that I'm going to give, is that um, one of the systemic issues that characterize economic crises is um, uh, misperceived risk. And one of the things that um, happens a lot in the private sector is that uh, risk gets over, overestimated during economic crises and underestimated at, during boom times, and we know what, where, where that goes. And so one of the things that, um, that philanthropy can do is find ways to share risk with the private sector 
when they believe the risk is overestimated. And so one of the things that we're trying to do in Detroit is uh, find a way to capture the value in Detroit of everything that's bought by what we call these large anchor institutions. And an anchor institution is defined by being an institution that doesn't get up and move. So these are hospitals or universities or other things. And we did an estimation of all the anchor institutions on one uh, on, on this Woodward corridor in Detroit. Um, they acquire, they procure $1.6 billion worth of things every year. And that could be laundry services for the hospital or bread, or it could be um, business services or paper or, uh, or trash collection or, 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 or waste management. And one of the things we noticed is that almost all of it was contracted with people outside of Detroit. And so we talked to the anchor institutions. We said, look, um, what if we could find ways to build local businesses that would actually capture some of that value and then you could create jobs here and we could begin to create a virtuous circle around it. And they said, yes, but we need reliable sources. We need to know that we're going to be getting this uh, stuff delivered and we need it to be price competitive. And so one of the things we're working on now is um, a guarantee that would be provided by the foundations that would guarantee delivery of goods from these newly created small businesses that would be selling things to these anchor institutions and then making sure that they could get delivery. And if, if something happened to the small business, it would be our responsibility to go out and find the goods and deliver them ourselves or have a third party do it on our behalf. Um, but certainly in financial markets, we see the same thing, that the perception of risk is huge. A lot of us think that it's overestimated. And then if there is, then there's a value proposition that can be made. And very often, philanthropy can fill a breach between uh, kind of an unrealized value proposition and get private capital back in where it needs to be. And we all know that for, for very, very big problems, they're going to require big capital that even goes beyond the public sector's coffers. Right? So we had a, uh, did you get a mic over there? No? Do we have a mic? Thank you. Uh, two questions, basically, one for George and one for Ivan. Um, Marcus Heap in the previous session spoke about Berlin as a failing city and he introduced this whole idea of poor but sexy as a way of perhaps dealing with the problems of the city and then there was a suggestion that Athens is in the same situation and perhaps an idea like that might work here as well. Now the Ford Foundation has done an enormous amount of work in Detroit which is really to me the city par excellence when it comes to urban decay that's been going on for years. and. Um, Athens, I think, is, is, is a failing city in a large scale, and there are a lot of cosmetic projects taking place. And people have the idea sometimes that you might be able to turn things around quite easily. And I wanted to ask you, in your experience, in working with Detroit and in Detroit and spending vast amounts of money, how difficult it is to come back as a city after you have crossed a certain point? So, so um, well, there's, there's a couple of things. One is that you have to understand that, that once you've crossed a certain point, if you've lost more than half of your population, for example, then the road back is going to be long. And you just have to accept that and be committed to staying in it for the long haul. Um, the other thing is that, that um, you have to be able to track and uh, celebrate um, success in small pockets. So Detroit is a city of 139 square miles, and we were able to, when I showed you the little T that we decided we are going to invest in, that represents about 15% of the land area of Detroit. But right smack in the middle of that, what's very interesting is um, we created an arts district. And one of the things about you know, cities being kind of gritty and sexy, who is attracted to the, that but artists? And we've been able to, to kind of watch the migration of about 20,000 artists who have come to uh, Detroit because, number one, it's very, very cheap to live there. But number two, it's kind of gritty and there's, there's ways that you can kind of engage that environment differently than you engage in other places. And we've seen many, many, many examples in the United States of older failing cities. Because remember, Detroit's not the, the, the first city that has had trouble. New York City was bankrupt in the mid-70s. Uh, Boston was almost bankrupt in the 1970s. Some of our strongest cities, San Francisco was on the ropes. Seattle 
1971, there was a, uh, a billboard hanging over Seattle saying, with the last one leaving Seattle, please turn out the lights. Now, these are the, some of the strongest cities we have, and, and they were all kind of reclaimed. And the first wave of people, the urban pioneers, tended to be artists who were wanting to find space to do their art uh, cheap and wanted to actually be in kind of a, a, whatever you want to call it, kind of the gritty atmosphere. I think Athens could definitely uh, use um, its kind of grittiness and its attractiveness to artists to find this. And it, there's a, a vagabond population of artists who will always go to the places that they think are the coolest and grittiest. So, and with the advent of the internet, you can find them very quickly and they find each other. So that's one thing, but, they, but the, the road back isn't going to rely just on artists, but of course, after you get the artists, you get cappuccino shops, and you get good restaurants, and then the next thing you know, you get the rest of the population who wants to be associated with that, and little by little, you build on those strengths as well. And so, you know, that's the story of the South End in Boston, that's the story of, um, of Soho and Manhattan, that's the story of so many other places that kind of, kind of redeveloped you know, through kind of sequential process like that. So I think that, uh, you know, I think we're probably going to be in it for 30 or 40 years in Detroit, and we're hoping that the enormous investment we're making now will become less enormous over time as more people show up. Did you have a, you said you had two questions. Yeah. Hello. Um, you described the main problem in Greece as uh, that of the clientelistic nature of the Greek state, which I think it's absolutely accurate. And I'm, I'm wondering, how do you break that hole? How do you break that dance if it's going on for over 100 years? And especially at a time when um, the current economic situation forces that relationship even more because people become desperate and then they reach for every single piece that the state throws to them, which is desperate in its own way as well. So I, I, I just want to know, how do you think we can break that hole? It's, it's very accurate what you said. If I can just make a, a, a lay comment on, on the um, urban question, I think that by virtue of the fact that Athens is the capital city of this country already has a lot going for it in, in, the, in the sense of reviving, renewing, you know, attracting, uh, and then the fact that you know, a foundation like yours is engaged in this uh, very important project, I think, is also a signal of, of the times to come, and obviously there's a whole question of you know how does one manage that so it actually then multiplies the effect um, yeah I mean you know as, as a political scientist it's kind of easy to diagnose uh, <laughs> the issue uh, because it's it's not new and, and we've seen it elsewhere uh, just some some un unlinked comments I think there, there's a there's an inbuilt problem when the state is one of the main employers and of course, additionally, when it's one of the most secure em employers. I, I see that in my country also, that uh, some of these graduates uh, that um, uh, Inigo was talking about, you know, even some of the good people go there uh, because there's a sure salary and there's a long-term prospect of employment. And I think that is part uh, uh, of the issue. And then uh, it addresses the dysfunctionality that um, you solve an employment problem simply by bloating the public sector. And then, you know, if it goes on for decades, then, then, then you're, um, uh, you're faced with this issue. I think, again, there's no silver bullet here or, or magic um, uh, medicine. I think it, it really requires that first step on a long road where you start deconstructing that system by building up, you know, the other parts of society, of the economy, and, uh, and, and this was actually clearly addressed yesterday by several of the speakers, you do have to open up the whole mechanism of, you know, how you get a job, how you can invest, you know, the red tape, basically. You need to start cutting the red tape. Easier said than done, the inertia of these systems uh, and of bureaucracies is enormous. Uh, whether it's a university reform or a you know health reform, th these are mega you know uh, ships that have to be turned uh, in high seas and and in a storm. But I think if if there's not that kind of holding hands and realizing that you must begin this, then we we will have done nothing. 
And uh, we had elections in my country just last month, and, and I said, basically addressing the kind of question that you're asking me, I, I wrote a little piece for the, for the newspapers. I said, look, if we don't have a government that's not going to address this issue of public spending and the bloated employment in the public sector, we will find ourselves in four years where Greece is today, namely with a, with a kind of re revolt and rebellion that uh, will actually solve the, w the, the problem in an uncoordinated and uh, potentially uh, dangerous way. So uh, you, you, need, uh, you need leadership, I mean, to, to state the, the obvious. Uh, and we don't, again, as someone else said, whether it was Marcus or someone else this morning, um, th there's a lack of leaders out there. Uh, and I don't know exactly what the diagnosis for that is, and it's not only in, in our region or in Europe, but, but worldwide, who actually need to actually fit and, and fulfill the job description that they've taken up. I'm going to take that as your closing comments. Uh, Inigo, do you have uh, anything else to close with? Well, I hope you will join me in thanking our panel for um, uh, an engaged conversation. I want to thank you for your time and your attention. So um, I think we're done. Thank you.